time for Global Insights, where we speak to experts from around the world on issues making headlines. As the COVID-19 situation in North Korea appears to be getting progressively worse, there are strong concerns over how the already repressed citizens living under the regime are being impacted by the virus. Access to health, nutrition and medical care are already known to be precarious in the North, but Pyongyang hasn't responded at all to Seoul's offer to send help. We discuss the situation today with Greg Scalati, Executive Director of the Committee for, North, for Human Rights in North Korea. Very warm welcome to you, Director, and thank you so much for joining us again. It's an honor to have you on our show. Thank you, Seong. A pleasure as always. Well, uh, there's a lot to uh, cover here, Director. And well, it's assumed that North Korea has a much higher number of COVID patients and deaths than it can really track at the moment. But uh, it seems like they were experiencing an outbreak before as well, but of course they'd never openly admitted it until now. How severe do you think the situation actually is in North Korea? The situation appears to be very severe. So uh, all we have right now is uh, North Korean data and we have to work with that data. There appears to be a fairly severe outbreak in the capital city of Pyongyang at about 269,000 active cases. That's 7.5% of the population of Pyongyang. Uh, there is an outbreak in Nampo, just uh, southwest of Pyongyang. There's an outbreak in, uh, in Kaesong and also in uh, Rason in uh, northeastern North Korea. So um, again, uh, North Korea has been relying on uh, social distancing, isolation, uh, curfews and lockdowns, and now they have a fairly big outbreak on their hands. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for the people of North Korea, uh, vaccines are not available the same way that they're available uh, in most places in the world, and that's the biggest weapon in the fight against COVID, uh, the, the, the health um, security of uh, North Koreans is very precarious. The food security of North Koreans is very precarious. Uh, the North Korean health care system, public health uh, care system is in, uh, in um, shambles pretty much. So uh, this is not good news for the people of North Korea. There's a big difference um, between this crisis and the other crisis that North Korea experienced um, after the Cold War, the Konanehengun, the Great Famine. During the Great Famine, the Kim regime was uh, able to uh, uh, direct uh, vital resources toward areas that were critical to maintaining, to preserving uh, the regime. Um, the key elites, uh, access to luxury goods imported from the outside world, uh, weapons, tools of death, uh, ballistic missiles, um, nuclear weapons. Uh, COVID knows uh, no Songbun. Uh, the, the COVID virus knows no loyalty-based social classification. COVID is indiscriminate and what we seem to be witnessing here is a major outbreak in the capital city of Pyongyang, which is the seat of North Korean power and privilege. This is a major threat to the Kim regime. Unfortunately, the people of North Korea are suffering, so we have to think about them first. And Director, well, why do you think regime leader Kim Jong-un chose to admit that there was an outbreak after some two plus years of keeping mum about it? Because the situation is overwhelming. Uh, it's, uh, things are getting out of control. Uh, there were lockdowns, there were crackdowns. Uh, initially, the North Korean regime dealt with COVID as a public health crisis. But then again, as it always happens in North Korea, they politicized and weaponized COVID to crack down on information coming in from the outside world, to punish those trying to access information coming in from the outside world. They politicized and uh, weaponized COVID to uh, control um, border, cross-border exchanges uh, very tightly. And uh, these lockdowns have had a devastating effect on the people of, of North Korea. 
So they've, they've also cracked down on the markets. Of course, if you seal the border, uh, there are no goods. Uh, there's no contraband imported from China to be sold at the markets. Uh, th th this crackdown on the markets has gone down to the very micro level where people who used to make, for example, bread buns out of their homes are no longer allowed to do that. They're not, no longer allowed to sell them on the streets. Why? Under the pretext of COVID prevention. Well, now there is a big COVID outbreak in North Korea. The situation is very dire. Well, Pyongyang seems to be saying that they're now enforcing a nationwide lockdown due to the pandemic. And well, if China's anything to go by, they've been in, you know, this might be even more dr uh, draconian measures on its people. So is there a danger that North Korea's human rights situation is going to get even worse, if that's even possible, with heavier restrictions on rights and freedoms, especially for the most vulnerable people, um, people in political prison camps, for instance? The North Korean human rights situation, Suyong, has already degraded. So uh, crackdowns, again, on information, on markets, uh, these are factors that the uh, regime perceived as uh, threatening to his grip on power. You know, speaking of the political prison camps and other people in detention, uh, the North Korean regime does not admit that political prison camps exist, does not grant access to any detention facilities. Frankly, the only way to find out what's going on at those facilities is to have transparency, access to send in the, the ICRC, the, the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, NGOs that might be able to investigate. Unfortunately, these detention facilities are off limits. We know they exist. We have satellite imagery. We have uh, uh, escapee testimony. They're out there. Uh, this is, you know, time for a, a big reset in North Korea. And the North Korean regime must admit that they have a very big problem on their hands. The world is willing to help the USA, South Korea, Japan, the European Union, everybody, including China. Um, so um, they, they really need to admit that they have a problem. They need to uh, admit that they need to uh, secure transparency, the possibility to run uh, fact-finding missions, uh, monitoring and evaluation. That's what we need in order to help them the people of North Korea. Well, North Korea seems to be turning to China and Russia for help while ignoring South Korea's attempt to contact the regime to propose medical support. Why do you think this is? Well, uh, the last thing that Kim Jong-un wants to admit is that he needs South Korean help. He rejected South Korean help. He rejected COVAX help. Uh, he rejected at the initial stages Chinese and, uh, and Russian help as well. Of course, Russia is caught up in a, a massive misadventure right now in, uh, in Ukraine, a criminal invasion of a sovereign state and UN member state. Um, so um, the last thing the Kim Jong-un regime wants to admit is that it needs South Korean help in order to will protect the people of, South, of North Korea and survive. Um, again, this is a mistake. Um, uh, being that ideological in approaching this massive public health crisis can have devastating effects for the people of North Korea and quite frankly, can affect the very survivability of the Kim Jong-un regime. And well, how would you, how do you think that the US and South Korea should really cooperate in terms of addressing this terrible situation in the North? Because the COVID-19 outbreak in North Korea, well, it really brings to light how many of us fail to remember the plight of the people as we focus mostly on the regime and its missiles. So what would you like to see, especially with this upcoming summit between the South Korean and US leaders? I would like to see full transparency granted by the North Korean regime. They're very good at doctoring their statistical data. Uh, they're not as good at providing the real data. We need to know the real data. We need full transparency. We need full access. That's what your doctor needs, the truth. 
unless the doctor knows the truth, there is no cure. So that's what humanitarian agencies need. Uh, that's what um, uh, UN member states ready to provide assistance. That's what COVAX needs. Again, everybody is ready and willing to help, but we do need transparency because you need to consult the patient. You need to know what the problem is before you, you provide that assistance. And well, at this point, uh, you mentioned some of the humanitarian assistance and the approach that is needed to increase transparency. But um, if North Korea does decide to accept outside help um, that isn't from China and Russia, but more from the US or South Korea, then how would international aid actually flow into the regime? Uh, there are huge issues. In addition to transparency and uh, being able to monitor and evaluate programs, having Korean speakers on the ground, having organizations being able to run M&E monitoring and evaluation operations. Uh, the North Korean infrastructure is in shambles. Uh, it takes so many hours and days to travel by railway or road. So, uh, you know, the, the coal chain uh, issue is another big problem in North Korea as far as vaccines are concerned. So one would need uh, very rapid assessments and very rapid interventions. Uh, that is possible from a technical and technological viewpoint, but what it takes is willingness on the part of the, the, the Kim Jong-un regime to cooperate with the international community and place people, the people of North Korea at the very top of the agenda. So transparency, cooperation, the technology is out there. Let's let let's make it work because we need to to really rescue the people of North Korea. This is a major crisis. And director, you've worked with multiple South Korean and U.S. governments in order to bring uh, bring to light uh, the North Korea human rights crisis and also to really put it on the leaders' agenda. And while the new South Korean president Yoon Suk Yeol, he mentioned the word freedom 35 times in his inauguration speech and also emphasized how Seoul would stand up for human rights around the world. So in what ways would you like to see him fulfill that pledge, particularly when it comes to North Korea? It's great that we agree on values. Um, President Yoon Seo Gyol mentions freedom so many times. Uh, President Biden, since before he was inaugurated, uh, mentioned that uh, shared values, including human rights, shared values with our allies, friends and partners, especially South Korea, are very important. One of the pillars of U.S. foreign policy, so is multilateralism. Uh, of course, South Korea um, has had a, um, a North Korean Human Rights Act since uh, 2016, since March 2016. We do want to see full implementation of the North Korean Human Rights Act in the Republic of Korea. Um, we want to see the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea appoint an ambassador at large on North Korean human rights. We want to see the Ministry of Justice of the Republic of Korea um, continue to run the, the North Korean Human Rights Documentation Office uh, we want to see the North Korean Human Rights Foundation being established in South Korea and uh, this foundation supporting uh, North Korean human rights uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations. Of course, in the USA, we also need to appoint a special envoy for North Korean human rights. We do need a coherent North Korean human rights policy in both the United States and South Korea is not difficult. Appoint the two special envoys, ambassadors, protect North Korean refugees, make sure that you bring more of them over to South Korea and the United States. We haven't been doing so well. And um, of course, uh, retake the high ground we once held at the United Nations, have the United States and the Republic of Korea uh, lead the, uh, the, the alliance of like-minded UN member states to, to push for and fight for relevant uh, North Korea human rights policy. It is possible. Um, 
I, I, I do hope to see, I, I'm not privy to this kind of information, but I do hope to see that uh, North Korean human rights is, uh, is part of the shared agenda of the summit meeting. That was Greg Scalati, Executive Director of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. Again, Director, it was a pleasure and privilege having you on our show. Thank you so much for your time. Pleasure is all mine as always.